So as I said, uh, we are presenting the preliminary recommendations for the Great Seneca uh, Plan. Um, and uh, this is actually part of an ongoing process. Um, it's a multi-year process. We started back in uh, February of 2022. Um, and with uh with our pre scope of work work and um presenting our scope of work in May to the planning board, um we are currently as you can see um working on the preliminary recommendations which we'll be presenting to the planning board on December seventh, uh and then uh presenting our working draft which is like the first real written draft of the plan uh early next year to the planning board, um with opportunities later for uh, the public hearing, which will give an opportunity to pe for people to uh, to present testimony uh, on the recommendations in the plan. Uh, and I'll revisit this schedule at the end of the presentation. Um, so really this is uh, the culmination of, uh, of kind of many different pieces, including what we say is like our planner expertise, best practices from uh, from the, you know, from our discipline as well as uh, research and analysis, community input. We've had a number of community meetings, uh, conversations, pop ups, um, as well as outspread, uh, uh, outside expertise in the form of consultants um, who have contributed to this project, and we really see it as an iterative process. So. As we write, make recommendations, um, we tweak them along the way based on both what our analysis um, shows us, but as well as our conversations with property owners, um, with residents, with community members, uh, people who work in the area. Uh, and all of that goes into the recommendations that we made. And um, as I mentioned, this is, will be these are draft preliminary recommendations, but we will be um, editing them up until we go to the planning board in December. And then even after that, we'll be getting feedback from the planning board and um, further refining these recommendations. So just wanted to give you kind of a backdrop of, of how we get to this place. Um, I think probably most people are, are familiar with the Great Seneca area. Um, you can see it here, uh, tiny in red on the map, um, but it's on the, uh, in the I-270 corridor. Um, and it uh, borders both Gaithersburg and the city of Rockville, as well as the town of Washington Grove. Um, it's a non-contiguous plan area, so you'll see better in a moment, um, but this is where we're located in the county. And it's a very large plan. It covers um, 4, 000, over 4,000 acres. And so really the purpose of this plan is um, it's an update to a 2010 plan. And the purpose is to really integrate some of the policy guidance that we received since that time. You can see some of the things listed here, like Vision Zero, like uh, the planning department's um, uh, general plan, Thrive Montgomery 2050, as well as um, thematic plans like the uh, Climate Action Plan, uh, Corridor Forward, and um, the Racial Equity and Social Justice uh, Resolution. Um, it also is a um, addressing some of the barriers that we've seen to implementing the 2010 plan. Uh, and it's taking into consideration new uh, infrastructure project projects like the Great Seneca Transit Network um, and planned networks like the uh, Corridor Connectors, which came out of the uh, Corridor Forward plan, um, as well as addressing kind of different emerging issues and trends um, that have come over the last 10 years we were reflecting as a team just how much has changed in the past 10 years that there was 10 to 15 years that there was like barely an Uber or Lyft presence um, back then and just trying to incorporate those types of changes into how we think about uh, planning and about the area. And then um, taking all of these into consideration, it's developing a shared vision for this area that will really uh, guide future development and investment in the Great Seneca area. Um, and as I mentioned, a piece of, uh, of this is uh, incorporating policy guidance from the racial equity and social justice resolution, and also really just applying an equity lens to all the work that we do. Um, 
you know, I think the biggest way that our team has seen this is that this area includes uh, one of the largest uh, employers, uh, employer employee cent employment centers in uh, in the county, and is a major economic dr uh, driver for the county. So, thinking about how do we expand access to this area, and that is thinking about how we expand transportation choice how we um, expand housing options, increasing housing, improving affordability and attainability, um, and then also expanding access for different types of companies at well, as well. So not just the behemoth large companies, but a mix of um, small and uh, kind of homegrown uh, companies as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is a long process. Um, some of our major milestones have been the scope of work, which um, if you go online, you can access all of these documents. We also have uh, a version of this presentation up on our website, which um, I'll link to at the end. But our scope of work, um, which was approved in May 2022, uh, our existing conditions report, which really talks about the what's happening or what's on the ground right now, as well as our emerging big ideas. And this that was kind of our first cut at our recommendations from a very uh, 30,000 foot view. Um, was uh, we presented to the board in April, as well as a community engagement uh, report in, in May of 2023. Um, so getting back to our non-contiguous plan area, as you can see here, the areas in uh, gray are make up the plan area and the areas in white uh, are not in the plan area. So instead of having cohesive boundaries like a lot of our master plans do, um, we have kind of this archipelago of, uh, of areas. So um, we have Quince Orchard that's on the Western side. In the center, we have NIST as well as uh, Londonderry Hoyles Edition. Um, on the Southeast, this is the Life Sciences Center. And this is where the universities at Shady Grove as well as Adventist Healthcare uh, Medical Center, uh, the Bellward uh, campus site um, and a number of other companies are. Um, we have uh, the Washingtonian Residential, uh, just north of it, Washingtonian Light Industrial Park, and then the neighborhoods of Oakmont, um, Rosemont, and Walnut Hill. Um, so all of them are in the plan area. Um, and we re I'll refer to them as enclaves, these different distinct areas, and we have recommendations um, for each of them. Um, so, you know, I talked about all these enclaves and as you can see from the map, they're very, they're spread out, right? Their city of Gaithersburg is 10 square miles right in the middle of the plan area. So they all have, not only are they diverse in character, but they have these different centers of where they turn to in terms of like cultural importance, in terms of places that they go shopping. So, um, although it is one plan, uh, we have kind of treated each enclave as its own, what we're calling books, or its own separate kind of piece um, that has its distinct and unique recommendations um, that match the unique character and needs of the area. Um, so uh, when we come out with a plan, we're, we're hoping to have these organized so that you can as a, as a resident or as a lawyer, developer, um, really go and turn to the page that interests you, where your property is or where you are, uh, you live or you work to see what the recommendations are. And we're hoping that this is a kind of a user-friendly way of doing it so that you don't have to read all of the Enclave uh, chapters if you don't want to, although we would be happy if you did. Um, but you could let us know how you think of that organization if you have thoughts on it as well. Um, so these are the, how it is um, organized, which I said, the Life Sciences Center, which is really the longest um, piece of the presentation tonight and will be the longest part of our plan. Um, it's, it's where we've seen the most change in the area and where we expect to see the most investment and continued change, um, followed by the NIST, uh, Londonderry and Hoyle's Edition area, um, and then the other enclaves as well. So I'll be going through all of them. Um, and this is the Life Sciences Center in that Northeast Care corner. Um, and the thing I wanted to emphasize about the Life Sciences Center is this is the area that really is the premier location for life sciences um, and the biohealth industries. It um, also has a lot of 
healthcare related um, companies and institutions, as well as the universities at uh, Shady Grove and the National Institutes of Standards and Technologies. Um, it is a major employer, um, both in this area and um, in the region. Uh, and it includes a number of life, uh, private life science companies as well. So our vision for the area, if you're familiar with the 2010 plan, doesn't differ that much. It's we, uh, we This plan envisions uh, the Life Sciences Center remaining a thriving economic hub, continuing to be an employment center that's also home to um, a number of residents with diverse populations, um, and that has these strong institutions like the universities at Shady Grove that uh, will continue to grow and the, um, the Adventist Healthcare uh, Medical Center at Shady Grove. Um, as I mentioned, as part of our uh, equity lens, we're also figuring out how this can be an area that prioritizes equitable access to jobs so that people all over the county um, and at different um, levels of educational attainment and experience have access to this place um, as well as housing and, um, and the public spaces in this area. Uh, one of the things that we're emphasizing is uh, that this area become a place with strong walking, biking, and transit connections, and that our roadways not just become a, a, a way to get through the area, but really uh, a meeting place for people um, and um, a place that accommodates people driving as well as walking, biking, and taking transit. Um, and finally, we envision that this area will become an area that is uh, more than the sum of its parts. I think one thing when you visit uh, the Life Sciences and particularly the Life Sciences Center is that it feels very disconnected. And um, we envision a place that through these connections, these uh, bikeways and walkways, as well as um, open spaces and parks becomes a place that really feels like one and that is knitted together. Um, so, to summarize the life science recommendations, it's really to um, increase the mixed use infill. So um, increase what is built on the parcels today uh, through redevelopment that's supported by a diverse housing options, safe and accessible and re reliable transportation infrastructure and services uh, and amenities that meet the needs of a variety of people. And we sometimes call this 15 minute living. It's the idea that you can um, park once and really meet a lot of your needs in one place by either walking or biking um, or taking transit within a short distance to do your shopping, to live, or to go to work. Um, and some of the ways that we are hoping to get there is through uh, integrating housing with life science and medical uses so that there is um, infill on sites that is not just life sciences, but might have um, apartment buildings as well right next to them. Um, Right-sizing our roadways and repurposing or reducing travel lanes. And when we say repurposing, that might be for other uses such as um, sidewalks or bikeways or um, dedicated transit lanes. It could be uh, for parks. And we have um, some of these recommendations throughout the plan. Um, and then also providing a, a network of active and passive spaces throughout the Life Sciences Center. And when we say active spaces, we mean places that you might um, play sports or go on a bike ride and passive spaces are places that you can relax and maybe eat your lunch. Um, so having that complement of, um, of uh, open spaces. And then importantly, thinking about how can we mitigate uh, the effects of climate change and how can we address the most um, common and damaging uh, environmental or extreme environmental event events, which in this area has been flooding and extreme heat. And how can we address that through design and through what we require through development? Um, the 2010 plan divided this, uh, the Life Sciences Center up into um, districts, and that's how I'm going to be speaking um, about it. So we have the LSC North, which is in yellow, the LSC Central in purple, um, the LSC uh, West, which is in blue, LSE South in green, and LSE Bellward is in that orange color. Um, and part of the thinking, as I mentioned again, is that they have these major roadways like Key West, Great Seneca, and Darnstown running through the plan area, and thinking about how 
can these roadways become part of the the buildings and the street life and the 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 way people are traveling up there instead of acting as these kind of um barriers from getting to one place to another uh, for people who are not in cars. Um, so in the LSC North, which is up top, uh, I'm just, we, I pulled out a few of the recommendations for each, um, for each of these areas. Um, and then, uh, so I'll go through those. Um, and I've also, um, highlighted some what we're calling opportunity sites. And these opportunity sites are sites where we see that possibility for either redevelopment um, or infill development. So where we're able to uh, fit more on uh, on a particular site or um, where the uh, the buildings are kind of reaching their uh, the point of obsolescence and um, will be redeveloped um, you know in the coming decades. Um, so, uh, the, one of the major recommendations in the LSC North is to reduce the number of travel lanes on, uh, Key West, uh, to create a safer and more comfortable environment for people walking, rolling, biking, uh, riding transit and driving. And how we're really thinking about this is almost as a, a promenade along the Northern part of, uh, of Key West, and then, um, having four travel lanes, uh, in the, the, or and keeping four travel lanes for single um single vehicles and we've um we've identified some opportunity sites which are uh the 15 to uh <laughs> 15 200 shady grove road uh the grove which is the area that's bounded by research boulevard um omega drive and shady grove road as well as the decoverly hall site which is um at Key West and um, Omega Drive. And these uh, these are sites where we see, as I mentioned, um, the ability to uh, redevelop in certain cases, um, such as the Grove or um, the, the Guardian property, um, or where there's possibilities for infill development um, and that the uh, developer may be even pursuing that uh, now, uh, such as Decoverly Hall. Um, in the LSC uh, Central, um, we are looking to establish a, as a downtown area that would have infill on um, on key sites, including um, the integration of housing on a lot of these uh, life sciences sites uh, or that have medical uses as well, like uh, the, the, the uh, Adventist Healthcare. Um, and then establishing a fine grained street grid uh, that would improve not just multimodal connectivity, but car uh, car connectivity as well. One of the things is as we look at reducing or repurposing lanes um, on some of these larger roads to reduce the barrier and the crossing distance, um, traffic can redistribute throughout some of these new connections um, in the plan area. So you can see the dotted lines in orange on the map is where we are recommending new connections uh, in the uh, LSC Central. Um, we're also uh, recommending creating an open space um, or park along Brochart Road. Um, and I've identified uh, these opportunity sites of Adventist Healthcare, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, the former site of Johns Hopkins University Montgomery uh, Medical Campus, which is uh, right by the National Cancer Institute um, and the uh, publicly owned properties, which are on um, Key West. I hope you can see my mouse. Key West and um, Medical Center Drive and Brochart. Um, in the LSC South, we're seeing uh, currently redevelopment, if you live in the area or travel through there, on the Treville parcel site, that's the area that um, has been under construction, and you may have seen cranes and buildings going up in that area. Um, so this is the, the rendering of the site uh, plan for it. Um, so we expect to see continued redevelopment, um, as well as the delivery of a um, of public open space in that area that um, that will be open for recreation for people working and living in the area. Um, we're also recommending um, improving Treville Local Park, which is in the uh, the south of the plan area, which is currently uh, undeveloped, just um, down south of uh, the universities at Shady Grove, um, and establishing a uh, Treville Transit Center um, hub 
which will be the terminus of the Great Seneca Transit Network, um, and ensuring that that transit hub is really meaningfully integrated, meaning that people are able to walk and um, and bike and drive and get there. And this transit network is um, currently uh, being planned by uh, Montgomery County Department of Trans Transportation and will inclu include connections to destinations such as the Shady Grove um, Metro, um, as well as uh, King Farm and uh, Downtown Crown and other uh, destinations throughout the area. So it will be a way that people can both connect to existing transit or um, people can take the transit to the life sciences or take it home. Um, Um, in the, uh, the LSC West, um, this area is also actually currently under, um, currently under development with a, uh, at the former public safety training academy site. Um, and we are recommending, uh, repurposing part of the Great Seneca Highway, uh, for a, uh, to pilot a linear open space, um, that would run along uh, Great Seneca from uh, Key West down to uh, Medical Center Drive. Um, we are also examining the uh, Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, which is just south of the PSDA site as a, uh, as a potential um, site for redevelopment that could, um, that could complement this area. Um, the uh, LSE Bellward recommendations um, are, remain very similar to the 2010 plan, if you're familiar with them. Um, we are going to confirm the uh, the, I2, the quarter forwards plan to bring a quarter connector through the Bellward farm site. So that is um, bus transit through the site. And then um, we are confirming the 2010 plan uh, recommendations, including creating uh, the Muddy Branch um, publicly accessible open space and adaptive reuse of the Bellward Farm, as well as the uh, Muddy Branch Preserve on the north side of the of the campus. And, um, and although I should say, so these are some of the recommendations that are kind of our big broad uh, or our large recommendations that will impact each of these areas and sites. But we do have a number of other recommendations from improving uh, circulation to um, safety in the area, such as um, recommending uh, new controlled crossings, so crossings that have a stoplight, um, and um, marking you know uh, crossings so that pedestrians can cross throughout our plan area. And there are other recommendations, like for the environment, um, where we're recommending um, a, you know thirty percent. Uh, green cover and tree canopy cover on our sites. So these are recommendations that although they aren't here are included, will be included in our, um, our written preliminary recommendations and those will be throughout the Life Sciences Center. Um, finally, uh, as part of the implementation of this, uh, of these recommendations, um, we are looking at creating an overlay zone. Um, and what that means really is like, uh, we have zoning on the ground uh, in terms of what can be built. And an overlay zone can add additional information of, uh, that guides development um, without changing uh, the underlying zoning. Um, so we are considering uh, creating an overlay zone that incentivizes housing within the Life Sciences Center and then would also alter the development standards that would um, achieve a more urban design that promotes walkability. So thinking of uh, examining things like the uh, the placement of the buildings, the placement of, of parking and its relationship to the street or the sidewalk. Um, we are also, uh, we understand that this area is a large area and it already has um, a lot of, uh, privately owned public open spaces. Um, and also, as I mentioned, is this economic driver for the county and an employment center. So one of the things that, uh, that we're recommending is to establish an entity that can really promote this area, that can promote it um, you know, at a more regional um, level, 
but that can also um, program the area. So, uh, you know, hold events um, or support the businesses and the employees that are already there, um, support residents and activities. You know, I think um, sometimes you see them holding classes or events at, um, at private open spaces. Um, and uh, and then really establish a financing mechanism that can advance um, our recommendations, such as some of the transportation and open space uh, recommendations that we have in the plan. Um, we also, um, the planning department is not an implementing agency, uh, but we uh, we have a lot of recommendations from things that we've heard from um, from community members and residents that are not in the purview of the planning department, but we think are important to pass along. So as part of this uh, plan, we will also be providing a list of recommendations to our partner agencies, uh, not just at MCDOT, but at um, places like DHCA, the Department of Housing, Housing and um, the Department of uh, Environmental Protection, among others. Um, so the NIST, I'm going to move on to the, the NIST and Londonderry um, area. NIST is the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. It is, um, you know, we are not really recommending any changes uh, for NIST. They have their own planning authority, um, but will be, um, are examining uh, Londonderry and rezoning in that area. So that's that little triangle that you can see highlighted here that is across uh, 270 from the National Institutes and in, uh, Standards and Technology. And um, going through this plan, one thing we became aware of is that this area um, is, uh, according to our community equity index, which you can find out more about on our website, um, or uh, you can ask Ben, who is uh, one of the, the creators of this, um, is that this area is, uh, considered disadvantaged for a number of, of reasons. And you can see kind of some of the indicators that we use, such as poverty uh, status, educational level, English language proficiency, housing tenure, and per capita income. Um, it's also due to its location, um, an area that has a lot of uh, environmental hardship as well. Um, so we are still working on recommendations for this area which will be forthcoming, but it is an area that we think is important to really uh, examine and see how we can uh, support uh, both by continuing to keep the uh, the number of affordable housing units that are in this area, but probably increasing housing in the area so that there's more uh, housing capacity there and um, figuring out ways to buffer and mitigate the uh, environmental uh, impacts of I-270 and of um, various brown uh, brownfield sites that are in the area. So I just wanted to note that because we actually do not have our recommendations for this area yet, but we, um, we are working on them and we'll be posting them when we post the board in uh, before the December 7th meeting. Yep. So increased residential zoning, mitigating noise and traffic pollution, um, increasing environmental features and improving equity related uh, metrics. Um, Quince Orchard, Quince Orchard is a primarily residential uh, area that also includes the Great Seneca, or sorry, the Seneca State Park um, in the area. Um, and as we, we don't really see this area changing too much over the course of our plan, if anything, um, we see maybe some gentle uh, increase in housing over the 20 to 30 year life of the plan, but that it will just remain an important environmental and, um, and recreational area um, with, uh, you know, with these established residential neighborhoods. Um, and uh, for the plan, we, we do recommend um, encouraging installation of rain gardens and bioswales to combat um, uh, flooding in the area, as well as uh, a recommendation for implementing a Germantown to Burtonsville breezeway that was part of the uh, 2018 bicycle master plan. Um, and um, also improving and updating the Quince Valley uh, neighborhood park, 
um, which is located in the south of the Quince Orchard area, but um, really see this remaining as an environmental, recreational, and uh, residential area. Um, so these are uh, Rosemont, Oakmont, and Walnut Hill, as you can see in um, highlighted in orange. Um, and Rosemont is a uh, residential area. It is um, surrounded by the city of Gaithersburg. Um, and again, you know, it is fully built out as it is right now um, with single family homes. Um, we, this plan sees that uh, this area will likely stay residential um, and may see some gentle increases in housing over the life of the plan. Um, fun to support the effort of the city of Gaithersburg to create a, a, a link, a bicycle link from Industrial Drive to Summit Hall in the area, um, as well as encourage stormwater management throughout the area and leaning on uh, programs from the county's Department of Environmental uh, Protection. Um, and then uh, we also think that this, it is logical and consistent um, if someday this area is annexed by the city of Gaithersburg. It is part of what we call the maximum expansion limits of the city of Gaithersburg. Both the city of Gaithersburg and the city of Rockville have um, designated maximum expansion limits, um, meaning how far they can go um, and annex um, different parts of uh, unincorporated county land. So uh, while this land remains unincorporated right now, we can um, imagine that that would be logical if someday the city of Gaithersburg were to annex it. This is not a recommendation to annex. Um, Oakmont and Walnut Hill um, include a number of uh, single family homes, as well as uh, small businesses, such as Hershey's Restaurant and, and institutions such as um, several churches in the area. It is also, uh, the area is also on the Mark Brunswick uh, line, includes the, the stop, the station at uh, Washington Grove for the Mark line. Um, and this area is included in the um, uh, Thrive Montgomery 2050 uh, growth corridor. Um, and, um, but uh, due to its proximity to um, the uh, 355 future 355 BRT, as well as the Washington Grove station. Um, but as identified in um, both the, uh, the Cornerstone um, plan, which is the, the mark plan for, uh, for rail, um, as well as the corridor forward plan, um, both recognize that to increase, um, to add stops uh, to the uh, Mark Brunswick, Brunswick line at some more um, potential higher serving areas like uh, Shady Grove or at uh, White Flint, um, we would need to decommission um, stops. And they identified uh, this stop as one potential stop for uh, to, to decommission. So if, um, you know, Although it's in a growth quarter, we suggest that if this uh, if this stop is or if this station is decommissioned, to not add or not change zoning um, in this area. Um, however, if uh, if the Mark Brunswick line um, expands service to this area and um, it continues continues to have uh, service at the Washington Grove uh, Washington Grove station, then um, a recommendation is to um, create a floating zone that would allow some uh, commercial residential neighborhood, uh, the CRN zone, which is commercial residential neighborhood um, and increase the, the types of uses that can be in this, in this area. Um, again, this is an area that is in the maximum expansion list limits of the city of Gaithersburg um, and could be um, a logical uh, area for expansion for the city. Um, Washington, the Washingtonian Light Industrial Park, um, which is uh, just uh, just south of uh, of the Rosemont, Oakmont, and Walnut Hill, um, is currently zoned for uh, primarily for industrial uses. Um, less than one percent of land in the county is zoned for industrial uses, except they play 
a really important role in our county's economy, um, both uh, for you know some of the the warehousing that we see, but also allowing small businesses um, to start up and have space in a, um, that can't afford kind of the uh, more expensive um, types of uh, of uh, offices. Um, and also plays a part in our life sciences um, economy as well. Um, so we are recommending retaining the industrial zoning in the area, uh, recognizing the important uh, part that it plays. Um, but as you can see, um, this area is, uh, this has a very high impervious surface. Um, it is, I think it says over 80% um, impervious. Um, so uh, recommending increasing the green cover in the area and finding ways to increase the tree canopy as well, both on um, private parcels, but as well as in the right of way um, and along the, buff the street buffers. Um, this can be especially important for stormwater runoff, but also for extreme heat events um, where there is there's no shade, there's no uh, rain capture in the area. So that is a priority for this area. Um, as well as reducing some of the, the distances between controlled crossings, especially all, all along Shady Grove, so that it's easy to access um, both sides of Shady Grove um, throughout the area. You can see Sh Shady Grove uh, borders this area to the east. And um, this is a little bit of jargon for you, but achieve a PLOC level two on all roadways. And PLOC is our pedestrian level of comfort. Um, we can also uh, drop a link to that um, later on. But our pedestrian level of comfort is how we think about uh, not just how safe it is to walk around an area, but how comfortable it is. So, you know, there might be an area that has a sidewalk. But if it's next to a road where cars are going 40 miles per hour and there's no buffer, there's no space between the sidewalk and the road, we might still say that's an uncomfortable place to walk, even though there is a sidewalk. Um, so in this area, looking, I mean, really throughout the plan area, but looking to achieve um, a lower or a lower number, which is a more comfortable pedestrian environment. Bear with me, we are almost through this. Um, so the Washingtonian residential is an area that's sandwiched between downtown Crown and um, and the Rio Lakefront. So it's just um, right there floating in between. Um, so it's between two commercial areas. Um, and right now it's, um, it's an area that is uh, impassable um, to get through unless you go around the sides. Um, so one of the things that we're recommending is if through redevelopment, we recommend uh, a street connection from fields um, to the Rio Boulevard so that you can easily walk, bike, um, or drive through uh, to get uh, to connect these destinations of uh, downtown Crown and the, the uh, Rio Lakefront. Um, we also... Um, would like to maintain the tree canopy in this area to at least 35% in case of redevelopment. This area does have a strong heat tree canopy and where possible, we like to maintain that um, because of the uh, the environmental uh, benefits that I mentioned before, but then also um, for the, uh, for the uh, kind of social benefits as well as having trees in our neighborhoods. Um, we are recommending prioritizing um, moderately priced uh, dwelling units and two to three bedroom units um, in case of redevelopment in this area, and as well as providing support to tenants in the event of redevelopment to ensure that residents um, have the support they need um, if their buildings are going to be um, redeveloped. And um, this, this area, again, I've we're not recommending annexing everything, but we do recognize that this too is in the, uh, the city of Gaithersburg's um, maximum expansion limits. Uh, finally, there is uh, the Enclave Highwood, which is off over here and it's surrounded completely by the city of Rockville. It is uh, 30 single family homes um, neighborhood. Uh, we recommend retaining that zoning, uh, which is R200. Um, recognizing the, the, the possible annexation by the city of Rockville, uh, that it is within their uh, maximum expansion limits, um, and then supporting the construction of a side path along 
the south side of Donstown Road, which would run by the uh, run, run through Highwood. Um, and again, encouraging uh, installation of stormwater management um, on private property, leveraging the county uh, programs that we have um, to increase things like bioswales and rain gardens, um, both in the public uh, and private realm. So I know that was a lot of different places and a lot of information. Uh, this is a complicated plan area that, you know, we always joke like, where do we start and how do we have enough time to talk about each piece? Because it's a lot. Uh, and we understand that not everyone is interested in all parts and usually have one part that they are interested in. So thank you for bearing uh, with me through the presentation. As I mentioned, we're going to be presenting to the planning board on December 7th. Uh, we will be posting a written document uh, at least a week, uh, approximately a week prior to that. Um, so we will send that out to the listserv um, that if you haven't signed up, you can sign up on our uh, website, but I believe that's how most of you found out about this meeting. And then um, from there, after we get feedback from the uh, the planning board and also incorporating feedback from tonight, um, we will be developing our working draft and presenting that to the planning board um, likely in January of 2024. Um, so those are the next steps uh, and kind of opportunities to, to participate. Um, just once again, this is uh, this is my contact information, which I can also drop in the chat in a minute once I stop sharing my screen. Um, and this is our uh, Great Seneca Project Plan site. So when I said check out our website, this is this is what I'm referring to, and this is where you'll be able to both sign up um, for the listserv if you would like to receive more information, um, and also um, access the PowerPoint presentation with a little bit more detail um, that I gave tonight. Um, I believe that is it. Um, but so I'm going to stop sharing because I can't see anything uh, while I share. And then I would love to uh, open up for uh, for discussion, for questions, for um, for comments. I know I see that Jessica has shared some information um, in the the group chat. So if you can access that, you can see some of the links that she shared. Um, and yes, uh, it looks like if you go to the, if you um, go to where it says reactions on the bottom, there's like a little smiley face and you click it, you can raise your hand. Um, that would be an easy way if we have more than one person who wants to talk at once for us to, to call you uh, and have you, you know, unmute and, and let us know what you're thinking. The silence is either really good or really bad is always my feeling. So uh, I'll give it a minute. And uh, also if anybody, um, yes. And as Jessica said, you're also like welcome to put things in the chat if you don't want to unmute, but you have questions. Um, and uh, I can drop my contact information in the chat as well so that if you don't have anything to say right now, but would like to follow up with questions or make sure that you are receiving all the information that you can either send me an email or give me a call. Great question, Jim. Yeah, so an example of privately owned public space. I'm trying to think of what we have in the, the plan area. Um, I know of a number of things that are coming in uh, that have not been built yet. But like, so for example, a lot of times when we have a development come in, we uh, we require the development, the developer to uh, provide a certain amount of, uh, of public open space, which means that it is available and open uh, to the public. It means that they can access that. And we usually um, require them to do it in some sort of usable form. So that would be like in the form of a plaza, or um, maybe a, a green space with with benches and a place that people could uh, could lunch. I'm trying to think of Jessica. Do you have a good example of just even not in this area, but maybe uh, a local example? I mean, so honestly, like you know, if you think about uh, a lot, a lot of parts of uh, the Rio 
even um, the Rio Lakefront and Gaithersburg are privately owned, um, but publicly accessible and might be, you know, part owned by this, like, um, owned by a corporation, but people can access it and they're not going to say, no, you can't come in here. It's only for paying customers. It's something that people can sit on a bench outside and enjoy, um, even though it is not owned by the county or by the city of Gaithersburg. But Jessica, do you have, not sure if that answered your question, Jim. I think some other um, examples that are coming to the uh, to mind um, include Ellsworth um, and sort of the the open space area in um, Silver Spring, um, the Pike and Rose, uh, the space in Pike and Rose at North Bethesda. Um, so those are kind of some examples of places where people in the community gather um, and sort of use them as social gathering places um, and to kind of like enjoy each other's company and just be in the space, but aren't owned or maintained by um, Montgomery Parks. And just to add on to that, oftentimes um, when we uh, require these spaces, they will come with a, a maintenance agreement so that they are to be maintained by the developer who may hire, you know, a third party uh, to do so, but that, yeah, Jessica's mentioning it's not maintained um, by the county or by a city if it's in one of the municipalities. No problem. It's a good question. We, it's like a very, can be very jargony. <laughs> Roddy, did you? Yeah. Hey, Marn. I uh, and Hi. just want to say thanks to everyone for putting together the presentation. It's very helpful to have the information uh, before the recommendations to see the recommendations before they go to the full board. Um, just had a question about um, the mechanics or how you envision the 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 movement, the the, the vehicles themselves, how to interconnect um, what you briefly described in some of these you know, different um, areas. I just wanted to uh, clarify, is, is this, um, Kind of going to be an enhancement of of some of the 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 bus uh, solutions that have been talked about to date. Um, is that sort of how you see and the cadence involved in that? Do you, do you have a vision for and um, how easy it will be and how you will physically move from from one of these areas to the other, knowing that, um, for example, on the Bellward side, we're looking at having some fields that that people might want to get to, um, and other parts, of course, have more of their retail. Um, and then, of course, there's the jobs and, and, and restaurants, that kind of thing. But is there a, do you have a vision for how those those different areas, how these different areas will, will actually connect? Yeah, and I might um, pull Alex in in a second, too, who is our transportation planner. Um, but so I think um, a couple of, of different things, Roddy, I think that's a good question. And I think that also, you know, if you, if you have uh, areas that you already know are a, you know, challenging access point um, where you see, you know, as you mentioned, like uh, the park developing on Bellward and you already know that there's, um, you know, a challenge or a barrier to getting uh, getting there, you know, let us know and we'll make sure that we've included it. Um, but I think the way that we're doing this is both through, as I said, kind of increasing the safety and the comfort of our crossings. So for people um, who are walking or biking, um, or even taking transit and their bus lets them off on the other side of the road and they need to cross, you know, having these ways that are easier to get through. Um, increasing uh, the bikeways throughout the area, because, you know, one thing that I know from being up there is that some of these places are not walkable from one another, right? Like they're, or they are, but it's a, it's a long walk. It's not a, it's not super easy, but they are easier on a bike. So having increased bikeways, including the, uh, the LSC loop trail, which was, uh, which is currently in the county's uh, capital um, improvement uh, program uh, being funded through that, you know, building those, those connections that can be for walking and biking. And then, um, uh, also, the transit ways that you mentioned. So we have uh, the Great Seneca Transit Network, which is a Montgomery County uh, Department of Transportation project, and it will uh, someday have four lines that are ending, four bus lines uh, that are like, uh, you know, kind of uh, 
more rapid, not exactly rapid transit, but more rapid uh, that will terminate at the University of Shady Grove and go off in different directions. So um, there'll be stops, I think, uh, throughout the life sciences center so that people will be able to get to different parts of it on these buses, as well as on the traditional, you know, ride on buses as well. Um, and then uh, maybe Alex, could you talk a little bit about the, the green spaces too that we're like thinking in relationship to the uh to the roadways or to the you know how that affects biking and walking sure yeah um and i apologize my voice is a little scratchy but hopefully it's uh, coming through okay um yeah and and so as marin was describing earlier some of our recommendations are to narrow the cross sections of the roadways um to really um support safety for users of all modes um but if, to your question about connectivity that really helps to make it safer and more comfortable for particularly pedestrians and bicyclists to cross those roadways. Um, so Key West is a good example of that, um, that Marin showed in aerial uh, rendering earlier, where um, currently it's a it's a pretty wide right of way. I think it's 150 feet today and the previous or the, the current master plan before these proposed preliminary recommendations is about 200 feet. Um, so it's a pretty wide distance uh, for pedestrians and, and anyone to cross, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So our recommendation is to tighten up the uh, vehicular travel lanes into a narrower cross section, um, reducing those from six to four, and then uh, incorporating a, an, a linear open space along the north side of uh, Key West that would be a more comfortable, uh, it's not exactly clear what the recommendations are yet, there's some flexibility there, but you know, a park-like setting or a more comfortable area for um, pedestrians and bicyclists would include a, a, a bicycle facility there. Um, which is also master planned as a, a breezeway, um, which is a higher quality bike facility that's intended for um, longer distance bicycle movement. Um, so that's that's one example of kind of bringing things closer. And then Marian also mentioned earlier kind of, so that's thinking about crossing these roadways, but also when it comes to traveling along the roadways and having more opportunities to cross, um, trying to reduce the distances between crossing. So some examples that are already starting to come in are along Great Seneca Highway where, um, there are signals going in that are coming along with uh, with crosswalks there, um, but looking to do more of that so that there's not as long of a distance between uh, protected crossings where you have a pedestrian head signal that will give you a walk sign to cross. Gotcha, thanks so much. Thank you. We also had um, a question about integrated um, signage for this area and um, that's a really great question. I. I know that all of us have had trouble navigating around this area as we've gotten to know it. And um, one of the things that we're hoping is with the recommendation of this like entity that I mentioned that could do branding and promoting and programming um, of the area, uh, that one thing that they might be responsible for is doing something like wayfinding so that it's easier to find locations like, uh, you know, how to get to Rio or how to get to, you know, Shady Grove or Falls Grove or something so that you have these these signs um, that allow you to orient yourself in the area. Um, and um, so that is that's one thing that we're that we're hoping that this could, this entity could do. And, you know, the this with the connections from the LSD through the city of Gaithersburg, that's challenging. So for us, we don't have planning authority in the city of Gaithersburg. They have their own a planning authority. But we do. Um, we do regularly communicate with the planners in the city of Gaithersburg. And I think that one of the things we can do um, in terms of thinking about these connections is highlighting the important connections. And then um, also we pass along what we hear from uh, residents or through our community meetings to the uh, to our counterparts in the city of Gaithersburg. So if there are, um, if you also have particular connections that you want to see, you know, please uh, please feel free to to email me, but we are going to emphasize the importance of connecting the LSC um, to downtown Crown and to the Leo, Leo Lakefront. Those are obviously important, you know, commercial and um, and in the case of downtown Crown, residential areas um, that we do want to see those uh, those connections strengthened. There are some natural barriers and there are, as I mentioned, some kind of administrative barriers um, to having that, that uh, to making those um, connections, but we we are working with our counterparts in the city of Gaithersburg. Um, and I agree that the the Washingtonian Rio um, has been a very successful place. Um, 
And I think that we want to continue to see both more places grow like that, but also to see, um, you know, our residents supporting those areas so that we have this kind of mix of of commercial areas and residential areas and employment centers that are just uh, where we see more of that mixed use. Um, so we can hope, hopefully continue to grow that as well. Um, yeah, Maren, can I chime in? I would just yeah. also add for the for the connections between the LSC and, and Rio, for example, the Great Seneca Transit Network, which MCAOT is developing currently, um, would have dedicated lanes that go um, up Brochart and then to Coverly to fields and would kind of help to make that transit connection more convenient between the, the Life Science Center and, and Rio. And um, Alex, I'm going to give you a second to read the last question that we got, and I'm going to begin it, and then I'll, I'll have you jump in. Uh, Alex is always popular at all of our community meetings. Uh, transportation is always a, a hot topic. Um, but I think this is a really good question. You know, we recognize that this area is an area that people travel um, especially through this area by car a lot. It's next to a lot of, it has the major roads that run through it. It's also near um, 270 and 355 um, and that it has the a connection to Sam Ike Highway um, just, uh, just outside the plan area, just on the plan area of, as Great Seneca travels north. Um, so I think that, you know, we we we're trying to balance um a lot of things in our plan and with all of our plan as well as the kind of the um the policy guidance that we have both from Thrive Montgomery as well uh which is our general plan which is really says to you know plan travel for everyone so that continues to be plan um for people traveling in cars and it just includes as well people traveling um, by bike um, walking and by and by transit. Um, so, uh, Alex, do you want to jump in, or would you like me to continue? Alex has more of the, yeah. the technical <laughs> skills uh, when it comes to to transportation. Yeah, I can I can chime in a little bit, and I, and I think going back to um, the vision that Mara outlaid at the early in the presentation as well, I, I think we are shifting a little bit in the way we're seeing this area from a place that the people are passing through to a place where people are and are traveling around. And so, um, yes, I think with some of the vehicular capacity modifications, there will be challenges for traffic. Um, but I think the way that we're looking to mitigate that and to improve the accessibility for the area overall is um, the inclusion of these new east-west and north-south uh, street network connections. So even though some of the larger roadways that are functioning more like highways or major arterials today will be reduced, um, there will be uh, at least three new east-west connections within the area that'll make it easier for people to circulate within the area and travel around um, by car as well as by the other modes. Um, so that's part of the thinking. Um, some of the modeling that we did also indicates that as things are today, a lot of traffic is um, exiting 270 as quickly as it can to try to bypass traffic on, a, on the congested roadway. Um, and one of the things that's included in the future modeling is the uh, I-270 op lanes project, um, which is underway. And um, with that, the modeling shows that there's less congestion on 270 and less of the traffic will uh, divert early through the Great Seneca area and instead will continue on 270. So um, yeah, a variety of ways that, that vehicles will be able to get around the area. Um, so if there aren't other questions, um, we can wrap up the meeting, but we are happy to answer or to get into greater detail on any of the questions, um, offline as well. Um, so if you, um, you have a question that you weren't able to ask, um, or you, uh, oh, Alex, can you explain what the 270 Oplanes project is? Um, but I'll let Alex take this, but we can also um, talk offline. So feel free to, to contact me, uh, find my uh, contact information in the, uh, the chat and I will direct you to the right person on our team if you still do have questions um, that you need answered. 
Yeah, I can speak briefly to the ops lanes. Um, it's, a, it's a project that would add additional capacity on I-270 in the form of, uh, I believe, high occupancy toll lanes. Um, so it would, would increase the capacity of that facility. And I can put um, a link in the chat to some more information on that on the website that you can view as well. And um, while Alex is doing that, I also just wanted to mention that we are having an in-person meeting on um, Wednesday um, at Lakeland Middle or um, Elementary School. Um, and uh, if you want to come meet us in person, uh, it will be at 7, 7 p.m. Um, and we'd love to have you um, and happy to have further conversations uh, in person. Um, but that will be 7 to 8 30. Um, And Alex has also uh, added information about the Oplanes I-270 uh, project in the uh, in the chat. Well, I want to thank everyone again for coming and uh, and listening to us. And we hope to hear from you. Um, we'll continue to send updates on this plan uh, through the list uh, the uh, the e letter. Um, so look out for those. As I said, we should have something written and posted um, towards the end of next month, uh, towards the end of November. Um, and then we'll be uh, send out also uh, a link to the uh, or information about the planning board uh, presentation as well on December 7th. But um, thank you, everyone. Um, and it looks like uh, there's another question about connector roads. Would the new connector roads not create issues with pedestrian collision incidents? Yeah, Marin, I can I can try to speak to that. Um, yeah, the idea behind the new connection roads is that they would be uh, styled as uh, as streets, as um, kind of lower speed, uh, lower exposure streets, and so. Um, while, while collisions can happen on any roadways, we find that the roadways that have the most risk for, uh, for crashes and particularly the kinds of crashes that result in severe injuries and fatalities for, um, for all people and particularly for people, the vulnerable road users who are, are walking or bicycling, those more dangerous roads tend to be the, the larger, higher speed roads with more vehicular travel lanes, um, somewhat like uh, Key West Avenue today. Um, but the idea is that we would be adding new, um, generally two lane roadways, one lane in each direction, um, that would be much lower speed for vehicles and much shorter distances for pedestrians to cross. So it would give pedestrians more direct connections to access land uses throughout the Life Sciences Center, um, and then, and more opportunities to, to cross. Um, and thank you. I see your chat about due to traffic diversion from the larger roads. Yeah, again, um, <clears throat> so the idea of the, these uh, new connections would be that they would handle more of the traffic within the Life Sciences Center. So today, um, generally to travel around the area, you have to filter out to the larger roadways and then back in to make local connections where streets don't go through today. Um, so something like Medical Center Drive doesn't, um, you can't uh, connect across. So you take Medical Center Drive down and around and up to Brochard again. So people have kind of more out of direction travel um, and, uh, essentially providing the new east-west connections would allow the traffic that's happening within the LSC area to use those roads um, and the more regional traffic would be happening on the other larger roads. Um, so, uh, and, and also due to the lower speeds on those roads, they would be less attractive for people to be diverting from the larger roads. Sorry again for my voice. <laughs> All right. Um, and again, if, if you want to email me, if you have more questions, then I can um, connect with uh, with Alex uh, also um, after the meeting um, so we can um, get into some of those transportation questions at a, at a deeper level if there are uh, if there are still still more questions. Um, but I want to thank everyone again for coming tonight. And um, I hope that 
I hope to see you on Wednesday, or if not, at least uh, at uh, at future uh, Great Seneca events. Um, and look out for um, an e-letter from us in the future um, that will have additional information, or you can check our website, um, which Jessica dropped in the in the um, chat. So thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.